Uh, this is the afternoon session, and uh, I think it's going to be a great talk. Good afternoon. My name is Joel Greeson. I'm from Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, I have the honor and privilege today of introducing two great scientists, two great speakers uh, that will, uh, I think, be formatting a wonderful discussion on the new Tempo platform. And specifically, we're going to be talking a little bit about surface ozone health. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Aaron Nigger, uh, who's going to be opening us up today. And then uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Arlene uh, Fiore after that, and then we'll take it from there. So Aaron, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, Joel. Am I loud enough there? Yeah. I'll wait for a few uh, linger, linger people to come in here. All right, so we will um, start off here talking tempo. I'm going to try to, I'm uh, not sure who is all in the audience here, I'll try to hit a lot of you know, from those who aren't that familiar with the mission to those might, who might already know a lot of information on Tempo, I'll try to um, give new information to everybody in the audience here today. All right, so, you know, Tempo is a tropospheric emissions monitoring of pollution mission here. Um, I'm the applications lead of the mission, and I'm with NASA and University of Alabama in Huntsville. And um, first, I'm going to kind of start off giving a tempo mission status, product update, um, information, operations. Uh, John already touched on the big uh, news that tempo was launched um, April 7th, 20 at um, 12.30 a.m., right at the top of our launch window. Here is a picture of the uh, IntelliSat 40 satellite carrying our tempo instrument. Beautiful uh, picture of that. I'll start off with some quick facts on Tempo for those who aren't familiar with the mission. Uh, it's our NASA's first Earth Venture instrument that was selected in 2012 and first host payload. It's a joint project between NASA and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. We have a lot of domestic and international partners. Uh, again, Tempo will observe atmospheric pollution every daylight hour at high spatial resolution from geostationary Earth orbit. That's kind of key, revolutionary, game changing. Uh, component of Tempo. We'll operate as a um, ultraviolet, visible, and grading spectrometer, and we'll be sensitive to policy-relevant pollutants, so we have NO2, SO2, and ozone, for example, and aerosols as well. And here's Tempo's field regard. You can see our coverage across uh, the greater North America region there, touching on a lot of highly populated areas with air pollution issues across the U.S. and down into Mexico, into Canada. Um, and we also have this new capability from space where we can actually separate and distinguish between boundary layer and free tropospheric ozone. It's key for Tempo. Again, we were launched April 7th, 2023, uh, just recently, and we are on our way to our uh, location at 91 degrees west, 22,000 miles above Earth's equator. And again, we're part of a geostationary air quality constellation. Uh, providing daylight observations uh, over the northern hemisphere. Uh, one key component of Tempo, like I mentioned, is this uh, ability to distinguish between um, lower tropospheric ozone. So Tempo will be observed in these locations right here, um, from 290 to 490 and 540 to 740 nanometers. And we have this new capability with our visible information from Tempo to have more sensitivity to lower tropospheric ozone. Concentrations. This is the, the averaging kernel information uh, from Tempo. So that new capability will give us the idea and we'll be able to characterize ozone pollution in the deep boundary layer region. And there's our nice pretty picture of our geostationary air quality constellation with Tempo now launched. We had GEMS launched in February 2020 and Sentinel 4 is on target to launch in 2024, last I heard. I have some, some fun launch picks I'm showing up here. So uh, there you go. There's a really nice launch video and that QR code. If you haven't watched it yet, a lot of details, but don't do it now. It's a, it's a long video. Um, but you can save it on your phone and open market. Okay. So the baseline products of Tempo, uh, this is kind of where we're talking on the uh, operational trace gas retrievals, you know, kind of a standard uh, general idea of how we are going to do this after launch and deriving our slant count density information um, using a spectral fitting technique and known trace gaps absorption in windows, then calculating our vertical count densities, um, which are a key product variable that will be within our tempo products um, using air mass factor information, rate of transfer models, um, 
and that vertical column density information and product really provides the idea or the uh, information on the trace gas column amount in the vertical above the tempo footprint. So here are our tempo baseline products that are set for the mission, uh, total column ozone, tropospheric column ozone. This is that PBL zero to two kilometer ozone uh, product I mentioned. That'll be the first ever from space we'll have. Um, and total column NO2, tropospheric NO2, and tropospheric formaldehyde. Again, these products will be uh, of high accuracy. You can tell the precision in terms of our total column NO2 and tropospheric NO2. And um, you know, we have our specs here for our precision for our ozone products as well uh, in terms of our baseline. We also have um, proposed or additional products on our list as well. So here I'm showing our full table from level 1B radiance down to our level 4 UVB data that are additional or proposed products for the mission. Uh, we have, again, our baseline mentioned on here in black. And then the uh, orange text are those additional products, glyoxal, water vapor, bromine, SO2, aerosol products. Uh, Tempo goes our synergistic product, which will incorporate some lightning information, um, an enhanced aerosol product, our hotspot information, and also a grid level two, uh, our level three product, which will be a grid version of our level two products that are shown on here. Uh, we're still kind of scoping out the resolution grid spacing of that product, but uh, right now they're designed to be at about five by five uh, kilometers right now, uh, or five, five by five um, degree, 0 0.05 by 0 0.05 degree uh, grid spacing across that field of regard. And then you can kind of tell most of the level two products are at the nominal tempo footprint of two by 4.75 kilometers squared. We are still scoping out our resolution for our ozone product. Right now we have uh, kind of two different possibilities there. And kind of the input from users and stakeholders will kind of also help decide where we end on that ozone resolution as well. Um, so right now we have about eight by 9.5 kilometers squared as our max uh, resolution uh, for our ozone profile. And then other important information here, these are all hourly, right? So hourly information during the daytime, one of the key parts of the ozone mission, it will be provided at that temporal resolution. All right, so in terms of the mission phase and operational timeline, again, we're launched. We are um, on our way to our geo orbit altitude and location. We'll be powered on around June 4th, the 10th time period, with the commissioning phase occurring between July and September 2023. Our first light right now is looking at maybe the first week of August, with a potential to start about 10 days earlier, where that will be TBD, of course. Our nominal operations starting October 2023. Our baseline mission length is 20 months. Uh, we have a, that, of course, this tempo instrument can last 10 plus years, and that will be dependent on those senior review extensions that will be ongoing after our baseline mission length. We plan to have our um, version one first round of public level two and level three data available to the community in around April 2024. And NASA Earth Data Search will be our kind of our gold standard way of accessing tempo data. And that CDF HDF5 format is our baseline format for the mission. I will show this is kind of how uh, tempo will scan after launch. Uh, I like to show this. This is kind of what we can expect from a, an approximation of a tempo um, scan pattern from morning to evening. This is just during a summer day here, for example using some of our proxy pre-launch data that we developed for the mission. You can see Tempo making those scans hourly across the field of regard. And by about 16 UTC, we now we have that complete hourly uh, scan being done across greater North America. Then you'll eventually see that scan line move to the west as we lose daylight in the east in the afternoon and evening hours here. Uh, there's a wildfire smoke plume out there in the northwest being observed, uh, being um, uh, on this day here that the model is picking up in our data. So this is kind of how Tempo will, will perform. We also have other sub-hourly scans we'll be conducting during the mission that are not shown here. And those will be these optimized scans that will occur over the east and west during the sunrise and sunset when our solar zenith angle is too high, you know, lack of sunlight to actually perform 
are um, and affect those management of the pollutants. And we also have our special operations. Operations. So these will be for dedicated experiments like wildland fires and just industrial accidents, dust storms, volcanoes, over a portion or slice of that field of regard. So, for example, for this event here, we could be doing higher time observations over this wildfire smoke plume um, if we have a special operations ongoing. The tempo footprint. So those have kind of given an idea of how high spatial resolution we're going to have. You know, obviously tempo. A revolutionary part of tempo is the temporal resolution, hourly, sub hourly, hourly during the daytime. However, we also are going to have high spatial resolution. You can tell from our field of regard, footprint size, high spatial resolution across many of these locations across the field of regard. Pick your favorite location on here. You can kind of see it in terms of the spatial resolution you'll have in this location, in those areas. And if we zoom into the Boston area here, you can kind of see the sub-pixel, sub-urban information we're going to have in terms of air pollutants uh, from Tempo over the Boston uh, urban region. And of course, we have the ability to actually do oversampling with Tempo data. So, for example, doing multi-week or monthly oversampling, we could get as high as one kilometer uh, resolution by doing these operations after launch as well. Uh, this is how we're going to actually provide these level two data files to the community. Um, so you can kind of see these 10 different granules across a field of regard, starting from uh, the east to the west on this hour scan. And um, this will help us in terms of providing these, this data um, in more of a near real time fashion to the community, too, and ultimately enabling a more efficient distribution of tempo data to the community by providing these typical um, granular information at the level two uh, data files. So in terms of our, I kind of touched on this already a little bit, but we'll have that data publicly available via NASA Earth Data Search. Our latency of our standard offline products will be pretty good, talking three to six hours for most of those. Our ozone profile will be pretty computationally expensive to run, so we're looking at maybe a day latency for those ozone profile data. And our latency of our um, near real time products are gonna be around two to three hours. So that's kind of where we're at right now in terms of our thinking in terms of latency for the mission. Um, and here's kind of our platform. We'll have temple imagery available in worldview. Uh, we have the EPA RSIG gateway, which will serve up tempo data. In fact, EPA RSIG already has tempo proxy data um, available in there. In their system. And here's kind of, uh, we already have proxy data available in Earth Data Search as well. This is me uh, playing around in Earth Data um, Search up there, picking out granules during one of the workshops we had recently. And there's the ability to have Tempo in ArcGIS as well. So that's another way we can serve Tempo data to the community. Briefly, I'll touch on the early adopters program for those who aren't familiar. So this started back in the 2019 uh, timeframe, and this was focused on broadening and enhancing applications of Tempo data. This has been a key part of the mission um, as we've been moving forward uh, toward launch and kind of engaging our partners, stakeholders, and users of the data and kind of trying to better align that, those Tempo observing time, products, and data interfaces to these user needs. So um, the ultimate goal here is preparing those users for operational Tempo data which we've done through tutorials and training sessions during our workshops, uh, preparing some tools for them as well to bring in and adjust tempo data. And then also kind of ultimately trying to maximize that value of tempo data for societal benefit. I will skip over that due to time, but you can see we have had a pretty robust participation across different uh, affiliation members uh, as part of our program. And here's kind of our application focus areas of Tempo that we have designed. This is kind of in partnership with our early adopters as well, looking at our key air quality modeling and forecasting, air pollution emissions and monitoring, and the regulatory science community. The EPA has been very involved here in the public health community um, as well. And kind of highlighting some of our proxy data here very briefly. This is showing uh, our proxy level two in, in O2 data from the morning to the evening over California, zooming in here. 
um, and looking at how we can actually observe that evolution of ozone precursors, NO2 for, is shown here, but also formaldehyde from a various range of emission sources, fires, urban traffic corridors throughout the daytime. For this scene here, we have a wildfire smoke that pops up in the afternoon evening, which is captured by our proxy data and will be captured by Tempo in the future. But only NO2, for example, does not capture that hot spot in the later afternoon, which Tempo will catch once um, we have that data after launch. And of, of course, NO2 generally peaks in the morning and evening, right? So here's a uh, shown here, proxy Tempo versus Trobomi. Uh, and we're getting that nice, uh, those peaks during the afternoon and the evening, or the morning and the evening that will Tempo will catch after launch and observe after launch. And finally here, I'll be quick, I'm running out of time, but this tropospheric ozone product here, right? So Tempo will be, um, we're highly sensitive to ozone in the lower troposphere. So this is a key part of Tempo. It'll offer new capabilities to track, predict, assimilate um, ozone uh, concentrations in the atmosphere and also that transport from the stratosphere to PBL layer as well for these products. This is a daytime animation of our zero to two kilometer ozone product and our tropospheric ozone. You can see how Tempo will capture these different layers of ozone concentrations throughout our troposphere. And also, also have this ability to fill gaps in our surface monitor coverage, which is pretty sparse out west. So it's another key component of Tempo. We have special experiments being designed. Uh, talk to me more about this. But if you want to get involved, we have a green paper right there. Scan that QR code. This was our uh, submission from our Colorado Department of Public Health partners looking at this uh, very highly evolving ozone um, transport in their region using our special operations to better um, understand ozone formation in that region and also the non-attainment issues they have in their region of uh, the U.S. as well. So yeah, this is a really important topic of Tempo and we can start these during the July through September timeframe during the commissioning phase. Now in here, kind of showing the summary of the Tempo strength and um, the ability of Tempo to provide us new information in terms of air pollutants, emissions, and observing small scale emission sources throughout the field of regard. Um, I'll leave this up and you can read through that. And I'll end with that slide right there. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron's been working really hard to make that data available to early adopters. Uh, and so we can practice working with it already. Uh, next up, uh, Dr. Arlene. Thanks. Um, so it's very exciting to get to be part of this session with Tempo now launched, and uh, we are all waiting with great anticipation for Tempo products. And so um, this is a figure put together um, by my graduate student, Madang Kui Tao, who's a fourth year at Columbia University. Um, and we're going to come back to this figure um, after a little bit of introduction. Uh, but what I just wanted to call your attention to at this point is that we have a set of seven um, sites where we have data during the um, 2018 Long Island Sound Tropospheric Ozone Study field campaign that some of you may have seen Alex Parabellis presenting on earlier today. Um, and so we'll be digging in to look at diurnal variations at um, these sites. And I promise I'll zoom in so you can actually see the tropomy and the tempo um, resolutions as well. Okay, so by way of introduction, um, I wanted to kind of just just sort of explain that we're, we have some groundwork um, and I'm going to use examples from my group, but the basis for thinking about using formaldehyde and nitrogen dioxide um, from satellite data uh, to learn about ozone chemistry goes back a couple decades. And um, Randall Martin uh, had the, the first paper using satellite data, but th that in turn was based on earlier work going back to the um, 90s, uh, work by Sandy Silman, as well as Gail Tonneson and Robin Dennis in 2000. And so um, my former graduate student, Xiaomeng Jin, who's shown here, uh, was trying to see whether we could use what we know about on the ground patterns in surface ozone with our gold standard monitors to kind of test the information content that is available from space. And her work looked at long-term changes 
in formaldehyde and NO2 from GOM going back to the mid 90s, Yamaki and of course OMI, which is still flying uh, today. And so just very quickly, surface ozone, part of why it's so challenging to control is because it's not emitted directly, but forms through atmospheric chemistry. We need sunlight, we need nitrogen oxides, a product of high temperature um, combustion, as well as some natural sources and volatile organic compounds. And so NO2 and uh, formaldehyde are kind of our proxies for those um, precursor gases. And then the, um, I guess I can maybe, ah, sorry, I'll just point in the room. Um, so basically the idea is that there's potentially information from formaldehyde and NO2 um, to differentiate between anox limited um, ozone production regime, where when we reduce nitrogen oxides, ozone decreases, and this is the case um, throughout much of the global uh, troposphere, but in urban areas with really high NOx emissions, or if you're in a power plant plume, you can have situations where you're NOx saturated and the high NOx levels are suppressing ozone production or potentially even titrating ozone such that when you reduce NOx, you end up increasing ozone. And air managers, of course, would like to understand um, what regime their particular air shed is in. And so um, Shambang extended this to also consider uh, the transitional regime, which tends to be when the highest ozone concentrations are observed and you're sensitive to both emissions of NOx and VOC. Um, so if I use this, I don't have to walk. Um, so what I wanted to step you through was an example um, from Washington, DC. These plots are a little bit busy, so I'll take a minute to just walk through them. Um, basically, the idea is, again, to connect what we're getting from space with, with patterns that we know on the ground are associated with an increase in the sensitivity of local ozone formation to nitrogen oxide emissions. And so you're looking at the Washington, D.C. area. Um, we have in the upper left uh, or upper right in the uh, red numbers is just the mean value of the formaldehyde to NO2 ratios and their range within the black uh, core based statistical area. You're looking at city center shown in a star. And then we have um, the three monitors that registered the highest ozone concentrations. And notice that they're a little bit downwind of the city center here in this uh, 96 to 2000 time period. When we move uh, to 2013 to 2016, we see a couple of things. First of all, the figure looks white, which indicates much higher formaldehyde to NO2 ratios. And now we have much lower ozone concentrations indicated by the red gradation in the circles. And they've also moved kind of on top of that city center, suggesting that uh, we're no longer in a NOx suppressed regime and moving more towards uh, NOx sensitivity in this area. So Shaman looked at this um, in seven cities across the US. And basically the, the story is, is pretty similar, although in places like Los Angeles, we still see some blues and greens, even in the most recent period shown here, suggesting uh, traditional or uh, potentially not saturated um, regimes. Okay, so we've shown that in long-term patterns, qualitatively, um, the formaldehyde to NO2 seems to be going along with, with um, increased sensitivity of, not, of ozone to nitrogen oxides. Um, enter uh, graduate student Madankui Tao, and she was extending some of this work, but now looking on shorter time scales using Tropomi, which of course has higher resolution data as we've been seeing, um, and focusing in during summer 2018 when this uh, field campaign was taking place in the New York City area. And some of you may recognize the slide from earlier HACAS meetings, um, but basically she found that formaldehyde increases on the highest ozone days, and the idea is she's composited over basically days when the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for ozone was exceeded in the region um, versus other days. Um, NO2 also increases, but overall, if you want to think about formaldehyde as winning out, that ratio goes up on the highest ozone days. And Alex actually showed a version of this figure earlier today, so thanks for doing that. Um, basically, what you're seeing is where on the left where there's more blue, those are kind of just a typical day, whereas on the right is the high ozone day, suggesting higher ratios. And again, an increase, um, which we're interpreting as an increase in sensitivity to NOx emissions on the highest ozone days. Okay, I also want to zoom in a little bit and just show you um, other evidence for the increases in nitrogen dioxide on the highest ozone days. And that comes from the Pandora instruments, which 
Jing Chu, uh, nicely introduced for formaldehyde. In this case, we're looking at the NO2 from Pandora's. And I realize you can't read the numbers, um, but basically the reds indicate increases in the um, vertical column retrieved by the Pandora. You'll notice the blue at the upwind Rucker site in New Jersey. Um, and she also showed that you do see increased NOx emissions coming out of um, primarily electricity generating units on the highest ozone days. Okay, so that's my introduction for what's been done so far with um, many of the satellites from which formaldehyde and NO2 have been retrieved um, thus far. And so um, we're very excited about Tempo. And as Aaron just nicely explained, of course, it's going to offer us um, high spatial and high spatial resolution. But um, the re really exciting advance is having uh, these products throughout the daylight hours. And so if we zoom in over the um, North, uh, the New York City area, um, this is kind of a, a clearer picture of where the Chopomi pixel and the tempo appear at the center of the field of regard, what those resolutions would look like um, compared to OMI. And so in the next few slides, I want to give you just a brief update of work that is very much in progress. Um, I, led by uh, Tauma. And this is in collaboration with, for instance, Alex Carambellas from NESCOM, uh, colleagues at EPA. And we're also using data um, that was collected by colleagues at New York State DEC. And so you'll see names on my slides to acknowledge all of these, um, this hard work that we wouldn't be able to do this study uh, without our collaborators doing, um, getting these measurements. So starting out with just the ozone monitors, our gold standard, um, this just gives an example of what the diurnal cycles look like at these um, seven sites. And we see that um, there's, they're pretty much similar patterns across um, the areas. However, if we now zoom into where we have um, formaldehyde, which unfortunately is only a few sites, but we're happy that at least we have um, a few sites, um, and NO2 shown on the bottom here, uh, you'll see that especially for the NO2, there's some different patterns um, at sites with, uh, for instance, Westport and New Haven um, looking a bit different. And so there are site-to-site -site variations, and we think that there's information here about differences in the local photochemical environments uh, for ozone formation. And so... Again, we're going to turn to our ozone monitors, but now we're going to, what uh, Tama has done is to composite on different kinds of days. Um, so for instance, we know that um, from a, a, a rich literature that there's weekday weekend effects in ozone associated with a reduction, um, usually thought to be in traffic emissions of um, nitrogen oxides on the weekends in, in an urban area or where you have NOx suppression of ozone or titration of ozone, you would expect to find higher ozone um, on weekdays versus weekends. Those are shown by the blue lines. We see at this Rucker site, there's really not much difference between weekdays and weekends. Um, and I'm showing you that circled in red where that Rucker site is. This, we're going to kind of look at this transect across three sites, the upwind urban core being Queens College and then downwind being uh, Westport. What Telma has also done is just to composite on the high ozone days versus what you would, I guess, not high days, so the mid and mid and low ozone days. And the other thing that I'd like you to pay attention to is just the shape of the um, deal cycle on the high ozone days, because that changes quite a bit, um, we're finding, from site to site. So this is Queens College. Um, and here, um, I don't know in the back, you're going to probably have to take my word for it, but basically we do see a weekday weekend effect um, with higher ozone on the weekend um, than on the weekdays at Queens College. Um, also note the more peaky, if you will, shape in the, the high ozone um, days. And then at Westport, uh, actually, again, you're probably gonna have to take my word for it in the back, but the weekday weekend effect is not there. We see higher ozone on the weekdays as opposed to the weekend. So again, suggesting that these sites are experiencing um, different environments for um, photochemical um, ozone formation. And so what we'd like to do in the work in progress is um, trying to link this to diurnal patterns um, that we're seeing at these sites in um, nitrogen dioxide and, and formaldehyde. Um, and so this is, as I said, work in progress. So we're not quite there yet, but I'll show you what we, where we are so far. And so the question we're starting to tackle is this comparison similar to Jing Chu for formaldehyde, but we're gonna focus on primarily NO2 column versus surface concentrations. Um, and how those vary during daylight hours. Um, okay, 
And so what we see, and again, this is fairly consistent with earlier work, including um, I think some work by Tracy's group and uh, work by um, Jeff Geddes at Boston University in the Boston area. Um, what I'm showing you here are these same three sites. Now the colors are the surface NO2 concentration throughout the 24 hour day, whereas um, the Pandora is only retrieving during daylight hours and not shown in black. Um, so we see different patterns at the surface versus from the column. Um, if we look at Alex's uh, wharf cam simulation, and this is just a reminder, it's pretty high resolution, 1.33 kilometers by 1.33 kilometers. Um, we see roughly similar patterns at Rutgers and Queens College, but Westport um, looks fairly different. And I'm at this point, my current thinking is that this could reflect a stronger role for Seabreeze at Westport and um, Jeff Geddes at Boston University um, has a paper from a couple of years ago noting the challenges of capturing a sea breeze and in a model. And of course, he is, as he will point out, that also matters for the retrieval since we have some model information typically going into our, our retrievals in terms of going from column to surface. Um, and he has some new work in progress um, in the Boston area, also looking at Pandora's and surface NO2. So stay tuned for that. Um, I think I'm running short on time. So I'll just show you, uh, at this point, we're just using them. This is with Alex's wharf cum simulation, looking at column formaldehyde versus surface formaldehyde. Of course, Jing Chu is actually using the Pandora uh, formaldehyde, and, and, which is great. Um, but basically, one of the things popping out here is a delay in the timing of the peak in the column formaldehyde versus the surface. Um, and for Westport, oops, right, so that I just said, uh, for Westport, we're lucky that we do have um, an in-situ monitor, thanks to um, Andrew Whitehill at EPA during summer of 2018. So in this next figure, I'm just showing you how that surface in-situ measurement compares to the model. And so the, the instrument suggests higher formaldehyde, but also a little bit of a later peak than simulated by the model. So this, this is basically all um, interesting uh, findings that we're looking forward to digging more deeply into. Um, to wrap up, uh, actually, sorry, two more slides. Uh, just to note, this is earlier work um, by Dan Goldberg that is looking at a different model, CAMBAX over Texas, um, showing uh, formaldehyde columns in red in the model uh, throughout um, the daylight hours. And NO2 is in blue and the ratio is in black. And um, I should have said on the earlier slides, there's a vertical line at 130, which is the Tropomi overpass. And so obviously this has implications for what we infer um, from current satellites that are only overpassing once a day. Okay, um, and then I just wanted to quickly um, show you, we have some work under our Haycast um, proposed project that is focused on public health applications. So thinking about what exposure, what are sort of the best exposures that can be used in epidemiological studies. And the point I want to make here is just that um, there's lots of options out there. This example is for, for surface NO2. These uh, first three are using, are just straight model simulations, uh, different models, different resolutions. Um, we could also put up three options of satellite-derived surface NO2 that combine model information with satellite data. Um, this one uh, is a land use regression based. It's the Larkin et al. land use regression model that um, Susan Annenberg and her team have combined with OMI and models. But what jumps out here is that the land use regression model, of course, is taking into account um, roads and, and showing much higher NO2 along the roads. Um, and then this is just the simplest possible um, conversion of a satellite column to a surface NO2 using, and I should say we, we apply this in rural areas, even though we probably, we, we really shouldn't be, but it's based on a, just a simple ordinary least squares regression fit between Kobomi column densities and AQ, the NO2 monitors in the AQS. Um, and so that's based on um, Dan Goldberg's paper in 2021. And so uh, my co-I, Marianthi Kiamortzoglu at Columbia School of Public Health is, has developed this statistical framework under NIH support um, and uh, inspired by the Urban Knox Tiger team, our goal then is to kind of combine across these different data sets and produce a best estimate um, with uncertainty. 
Okay, and then I'm just going to put this up. Um, these were some of the questions that I was kind of thinking about as I put the talk together and hope we have, hope I left enough time for discussion. And I know um, Joel also has um, some, some slides. Did you want to? I'm done. Thank you. Right. <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you what, why don't we have uh, Aaron and Arlene, if you can stay up here, why don't you guys come up here while we're, we're transitioning? Uh, we can come back to this slide. Um, there's a couple of things that I guess to put in context this discussion. Um, and I think Arlene was showing some great di dial cycles and how uh, uh, Tempo is going to be able to see that, I uh, hopefully, and verify some of the models. But in a larger sense, the blue states up there are um, what I'm drawing the data from. And this is the energy generation from those states since 2010. We have dropped 74% of the NOx coming from those states. And some of the figures that you saw from satellite, those are some of the biggest producing states for NOx. We dropped 74% in the last 12 years or so. But then in the last year, last year of data, we actually dropped another 20% as we're dropping more and more coal off of, the, off of the market. So there's a huge transition that's ongoing right now. But the ironic thing is the East Coast has already had its first ozone exceedance this year because some of the fires that are happening up west in those same regions are overtaking probably some of the NOx that are is being reduced. So we're actually seeing it from the water side too for ozone. Um, and I, I, I think I'm gonna pass this up. This is just talking about, uh, I'm hoping Tempo can help us with uh, sensor studies also uh, at the state level. But I, I wanna also transition to discussion. So we'll open the floor up to uh, discussion from the audience. Uh, these are discussion prompts, things for you to think about if you don't have a question uh, on your own already, uh, but uh, turn it over to the floor. We have, uh, discussion, questions, or if Aaron and Arlene, if you guys would like this to open up to, you're welcome to do that also. So, questions? I saw Laura first. I had one that I wrote down for Aaron that I was thinking about when you showed the table of Tempo's products and the, the near surface, or the ozone profile product having an undecided spatial resolution, right? So it's like four coatta pixels versus two coatta pixels, I think. Is is the trade-off, is it the computational uh, challenges? Or, or so like, well, it, is the quality of data gonna be the same at both those resolutions? So right now it's more of a computational challenge with the team. Um, so we, there's a possibility getting that down to our original was actually the four co-added pixel um, resolution that was increased in terms of co-adding. Um, so that is going to be a discussion based on kind of the end user stakeholder feedback too, on kind of the, their requirements on ozone resolution, which we could have here in, uh, in this meeting, and also kind of the computational expense of that product and getting it out within that day latency period too. And um, yeah. It was really nice that it was brought up at the end about using these um, data products that are really more intended for uh, urban areas and then trying to apply them to rural areas. I guess one part of my question is, how do you think Tempo is going to kind of help with that problem? Because I know even in models, sometimes they overestimate um, compared to uh, Chicomi, they overestimate in areas that have that are these metropolitan areas. And then you try and make comparisons in places that have maybe less roads or less spatial surrogates. And it's I'm um, really missing what's like kind of really going on there. And do you think that Tim is going to have a better like answer to a lot of those problems of trying to look at air pollution in more rural areas in the US? I can go ahead and start with that one. Yeah, in general, like we I've talked on the ozone profile information right now, we generally see the tropospheric ozone information, even from tropomy. And um, I'm not sure how that, how good that product is, but the fact that we're gonna have this um, hourly, sub-hourly ozone information within the troposphere and the actual you know, PBL layer, it's gonna really better understand kind of where those um, precursor gases are actually emitting and kind of how that's contributing to the ozone production in these different, different layers of the atmosphere. So we're kind of seeing the whole evolution um, in terms from the stratosphere to the PBL layer, and kind of also at the same time observing 
the different uh, precursor gases um, at that hourly, sub hourly scale. So they'll better resolve um, kind of source attribution studies, um, how that's contributing to ozone production. Um, you know, the whole chemical transport process from the emission stage to the actual um, these non attainment areas we see, right? That the Colorado Department of Public Health are very intrigued by. You know, they want to know what is happening on the Colorado Front Range, why those ozone attainments are occurring. Um, you know, they know there's a bunch of oil and gas production in that region, but they'll much, much have a much more capability to better resolve that through tempo data um, in that region. So I, I guess I'll just add a, a comment, um, and that is that, you know, as Joel brought up, right, the anthropogenic sources of nitrogen oxides have been coming down dramatically in recent years. And so, but we also, of course, have natural, or I don't know how we want to think about fertilizer, that's probably not natural, but <laughs> yeah, but, but sort of maybe what we might think of as, you know, agricultural or more diffuse sources of um, nitrogen oxides, such as soil NOx. Um, and of course, one of the things that we always have to think about when retrieving, you know, kind of whether in urban or rural areas is lightning NOx, and that's in higher up in the troposphere, and the instrument's going to be more sensitive to that. And so I think these are, are challenges that, um, that, that we have to sort of think about to try to derive the, the surface concentrations. Um, at the same time, it's exciting to think about having this diurnal uh, profile because there may be, and I'm probably um, showing my ignorance here, but there may be different temporal patterns associated with these different um, sources, right? And so thunderstorms, for instance, with lots of lightning, we probably can figure out when they're happening and sort out, you know, with tempo, well, what was happening before the storms kicked up or, and, and what does it look like after, which might have the lightning knock signature. And so I'm, I'm really excited about the potential to learn about not just what's going on at the surface, but also aloft um, from these temporal, temporal tempo data. <laughs> Okay, we have a question from online um, from Ryan Stoffer, uh, who asks, uh, or says, uh, GEMS has been in orbit for more than two years. Since it is, from my understanding, Tempo's twin, what have we learned about its near surface ozone retrieval capability for applications over North America? Well, you know, it, GEMS is the sister mission of Tempo, but the Tempo is different from GEMS in that we have this additional um, visible spectrum we're working with in order to retrieve, you know, our ozone concentrations in the um, lower level, lower troposphere. GEMS standard products only provide um, total column ozone and tropospheric ozone. Um, they don't have that additional, they go from 300 to 500 nanometer range. That additional visible capability really improves Tempo retrievals. But in terms of um, near surface ozone, we can't really see that or retrieve that very well with GEMS. Um, we, I don't know, I haven't looked at our products enough in terms of tropospheric ozone from GEMS to really evaluate or understand what they're doing in terms of that and how their products, um, how their products doing. But in terms of lower troposphere, we won't get that information from GEMS directly. I actually forgot, I stole some bling from NASA on the table. So if you ask questions, I've got some stuff to give out to you guys. So who wants to, uh, uh, I forgot. Uh, I'll give you guys your bling later. Just go to the table. Oh, there we go. Here, here's the bling winner. <laughs> it's all of these things. Um, uh, my question, Aaron, is about the special ops that you talked about in does that take away from the regular scan that's going to occur and where you decide on the special ops and the green papers and things? Is that dependent on those granules uh, that, that you showed? Yeah, um, so it, yeah, I've got the, the slide. I meant to talk on that slide longer and actually show the QR code to people. Um, I went pretty quick there. But yeah, the uh, special observations is a unique part of Tempo. Um, we do have like up to 25% of our mission that can be committed to those special observations. And one of the key parts of our phase of the mission right now is to coordinate those special observations being requested from our end user stakeholder community in this green paper 
and uh, coordinate those with also those who obviously only want the standard hourly observation. So we're not, our plan is not to have special OBS ongoing throughout an entire day, take away from the normal operations, but also but, you know, during these major disaster events or air quality disasters, we can have those operations ongoing um, for maybe a one or two hour time period, right? Um, let's go to that slide, all right. There we go. So that kind of went quick, but we have a, a number of experiments already shown there, you know, and some are kind of validation experiments, uh, one over Toronto, the Utah summer ozone study. Um, we have scope two also mentioned on there. So yeah, we're gonna coordinate those. We have a management plan um, designed to kind of, um, that's one of the one topic area of our May meeting too in Huntsville is to kind of uh, the pathway to coordinating those operations and not having a major impact on the, the standard nominal operations of our end user stakeholder community. I can just get this out. musical microphones. Um, a follow up to that question. Um, who has sort of standing to request a special um, observation? And I guess on the flip side, is there a mechanism in place for um, uh, organizations to push back on some of this observation? I just, an example would be, you know, um, earlier today, uh, the Libby um, talked about um, um, industrial emissions during, and, and it may be that, you know, a community group wants to request a flyover and the industrial uh, facility does not want a flyover. And I guess one, what is the mechanism? Like, do they pick up the phone and call you, Aaron? Or like, who, how do those requests come in and who adjudicates? Or like, if there's three requests for the same time, which one gets picked? Like, what is the process there? Yeah, so that is, again, um, discussion to be had, but we are, the main operation right now is to get these in the pipeline, which we're doing now with the green paper. Um, and then after the, um, we have these observations ongoing, we can actually, uh, one of the points here is to have that team who requests the special experiment to have the resources available to all, also monitor these operations, right? So if they have, let's say Libby's team um, catches an industrial accident and they had a green paper experiment in the pipeline, um, you know, they can actually ping me, the team, say, hey, we have this ongoing disaster event um, that is then relayed to the, the ball aerospace and the people who point the instrument and we can go from there. We can actually operate these within a two hour time frame, two to three hour time frame of when that event of, of notice of that event. So that's kind of our plan right now. So can I just restate to see if I understood yeah. that basically if you're, you know, whether it's someone online or in the room thinks that they may want to request a special study area, yeah. they should get involved in the green paper. Exactly. That's kind of the point of, you know, I thought the example Libby showed earlier was excellent in terms of a possible special experiment, right? Uh, you put in the pipeline, there's a request document we have online, which is available on that page, I believe. Um, but yeah, we have a request document, we put that in the pipeline, and then we'll have that in the paper. So then once that event does occur, we have that operation, we know where it will occur, um, and we'll get that done for the user community. And so then I just want to say, this is super helpful. I'm really glad I heard this. I think one issue that, you know, is striking me is that, I mean, I, when I heard experiment, that sounds like scientific research and green paper sounds like a technical scientific report, uh, but what I'm hearing, but I think a lot of stakeholders are using this from a more operational, like real time boots on the ground or the sky um, idea. And so I think it's actually uh, really helpful to know that the green paper uh, is really more of a planning document to be responsive to a wide range of even not research. Exactly. And that's, we've been working a lot more with the regulatory science community. And Colorado Department of Public Health is one of those um, who have been involved in those. So uh, that's kind of what we want. We want the feedback from those type of end user stakeholder community, which, which can have a really big impact in terms of societal benefit too. So, so it sounds like just 
to make sure that I understand that your entry ticket is the green paper, but then I, I was still wondering with from Tracy's question, like on the day of, like let's say all of a sudden three of your special experiments all want all like you know the the industry problem. There's a wildfire. There's something else. Um, who get who makes that final call like the day of like whether the two hours go to experiment A, B, or C? That's going to be a coordination between myself, Barry Leffer, um, other NASA um, managers as well. So a good great example is we have one of our in Ken Pickering is a big lightning Knox person, right? He's going to be definitely looking at and evaluating lightning Knox, where those lightning incidents occur. He can then relay information to us on where the models are picking up on a possible major lightning event. We can kind of then start to scope out where those operations can happen um, in coordination with Ken and then Barry, et cetera, um, higher up. I just kind of wanted to add to this. So the other thing that's exciting about Temple is, so it's a NASA Earth Venture mission that, you know, has a, has a lifetime that hopefully will be a decade. But now there is operational follow-ons to Temple. There'll be a geostationary UV Viz instrument that will begin flying in 2030 or so and continue for another 30 years. So all the agencies, you know, that are investing time and effort in using this data, there'll be operational follow-ons. And just like our current GO satellite, there's mesoscale sectors. It's the same thing. And right now, field campaigns and things can say, we'd like a mesosector here to look at this thing. Different regions can say, we want a mesospector here to look at a fire. And now you'll be able to do that same thing with, with air quality, which is really exciting. And the green paper, is the first sort of collect the community ideas about that. Just excited to see how it happens. Yeah, great point. On the continuity we're gonna have with GeoX in the future and uh, beyond. So we're gonna have 20 plus years lined up, hopefully for tempo, obser tempo like observations over greater North America. Is there any questions online at the moment? So question, I have a question. Is, NASA are going to be displaying this on a public facing website operationally. And if yes, is NASA prepared to answer public inquiries of what is happening at my location right now? Because I see something changing. There's a red blob coming my way. Yeah. You're referring to the special experiment. Well, let's just say you're, I can go onto a meteorological website, whatever it may be, and I can find a satellite image, visible satellite for the day. Are you, are you going to plan on doing something like that for, for tempo data where I can just go? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're, yeah, 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 definitely. Worldview will be our uh, golden source. I could get the golden mechanism to visualize tempo data. But that being said, we have, you know, the EPA and our SIG having a great platform there. Uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, they already have tempo proxy data already feeding into their system. Um, so that's another great way that, the stakeholder community and end users can view tempo data and visualize tempo data. So the follow-on question to that is, let's say Joe Smith uh, finds the data and he now sees a red blob that he's never seen before coming to his area. And let's say it's coming from the train wreck in the area in Ohio. How is he going to interpret that? Is NASA going to be able to educate the public on this new, really revolutionary form of display of what's actually happening in their air quality? Yeah, I think um, I think this is getting back to maybe the RSET training, what we do at that program, uh, trying to better help the users understand the data um, visualizations of products. Um, so yeah, we already had a um, RSET training in uh, the EPA facility there in Durham um, to kick off that whole pathway to having tempo training. So we're definitely going to have tempo training in the pipeline for RSET to um, have those community members better understand the products. We've been doing that a little bit in terms of our tempo early adopters, having workshops, data tutorials. We'll do that as well um, with the community to help them learn, visualize tempo data um, in the future as well. Thanks, sir. That's what you're getting at, I think? Well, there, there's a public side of that yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the public side of that, because I think that that's bringing up this very interesting scenario 
And I mean, what like the scenario I hear, and I mean, Joel's at Maryland, but you know, I'm in Wisconsin and you know, there's people at home who are, you know, checking their website, just to check air now. And now they'll maybe check the tempo website. And if they see a blob, they'll probably call the DNR the, here in Wisconsin or wherever their state agency is, or maybe their mayor's office. And, and so I, you know, I think it, 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 it sets off an interesting, I think, domino effect about who's supposed to be taking the RCEP training. I mean, you know, Joe at home or Susan at home is not necessarily going to take RCEP training. And even if they did, it's like seeing a red blob doesn't take RCEP training to tell that there's something going on and they want to know what's going on. They don't, they don't need to know the averaging kernel. They want to know like what is causing the blob. And so I think the sort of question is like, what does this mean for outreach? And what does this mean? Like, how do we empower organizations that might get some of those questions so that we can turn this into a pro uh, and not a, a con? And I think John has that. And yeah, 100% agree with Tracy and, and what's been said here. It, and it, when you're talking about for, for, for lay people, for the public in general, we're not talking about an RCEP thing. We're talking about no. a communications thing. Right. And uh, many of you have taken our comms people's workshops before, which are awesome, um, because that's it, you know, ultimately falls to us a lot of times to communicate that. Uh, as Aries always tells me, how would you explain what you do to your mom or your grandma? Um, and, and why is it important? And you know, it's up to our communications people to be producing a lot of this information that, circle back to what I was talking about this morning, just one piece of the puzzle, but at the Earth Information Center and what it's meant to be, both in a virtual sense and in a real physical sense at NASA headquarters. And eventually there's going to be another site uh, planned at the Smithsonian Natural History, um, yeah, Museum of Natural History, where so for the general public to be able to come in and for them through interactive, um, you know, hyper walls and what have you, they're going to be able to say, oh, what's the air quality in my hometown today? And it will communicate to them that this is a, you know, the air quality is this, and this is what the satellite data says, and this is what the EPA ground data says, and this is why it's important, and this is what PM 2.5 can do to your health, blah, 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 blah. And so, and that will also be online in a virtual sense as well. So it's meant to get this information to the public in an accessible way where they can understand why their taxpayer money is being spent on this and why it's important. Um, but I think that is not an R set thing. I think that's a no, no. outreach I mean, communication. I guess those, yeah. No, I agree. Same point. Yeah, yeah. I'll just say uh, Tracy makes a good point. They'll see something, and where are they going to go to? They'll go to their local air quality management agency. And that's why there's the early adopters program so that the local air quality management agency knows what tempo is and knows how to articulate it to the to the public i think that you know that's a, and that's what haycast is doing too making sure that not just we're not going to teach everyone on the planet but we can at least teach those stakeholders that that those people will go to they'll go to the national weather service national weather service is obviously very engaged in tempo as well and you know they'll they'll be able to respond if we're giving them the information. We're real close to the end of the hour, uh, but uh, go ahead. A quick one clarification, Christian, and maybe follow-up comments. Um, it, it's my understanding that the current scenario that we are talking about is a more likely real-time reporting to the public, but the um, detection data that Temple is making, right? So I guess uh, one one sort of wish list or comments that I can make is it's like a, uh, other micro sensor that uh, compared to the QAQC um, regulatory monitor that I hope that there is a big sign in the public interface saying that this data is subject to further QA so that they are not really panicked about what they see because possibly there is a uh, chance that the data may be uh, revised at the end for the final product. But that itself I think will help quite a lot you know, giving a message to the public that it's not going to be the end product that you are seeing right now, so that regulatory agency may not be saying, you know, again and again, um, every call that this is not regulatory data yet. Um, so that itself will help a lot. I think. Yeah, 
that we'll definitely have um, different versions obviously coming out. Well, version one, you're right, 2024, and we'll have uncertainty variables along with those products that will relate that kind of information to the in your stakeholders. But yeah, um, that will be hopefully um, very well, um, we will inform the community of those kind of changes and updates to the products. All right, we're, we're all, that's uh, kind of a critical discussion at the end. Oh, okay, we're, we're ending, but all right. <laughs> um, and it's not directly related to that, it's just popped in my head, going back to communications, just FYI, and because NASA's gonna have a huge push at the end of the week. We already had a huge push for the last several weeks about tempo, and I mean, so many people probably in this room have been interviewed, or Doug's been interviewed all about, you know, Aaron, everybody, but uh, Earth Day is the end of the week on Saturday. And so this is a prime opportunity uh, for y'all to reach out at your own universities, your own local media and all that to not only promote our, our PayCast, but also promote, hey, we just had a huge revolutionary launch. It's really cool. And this is what it's going to do for you. Um, so I know NASA is doing a big push for that. So we're having a lot of like live interviews on Friday schedule for across the country and affiliates, things like that. So um, just throwing that out there. Yeah, not trying to be critical tempo, just going through the going through the scenario. Uh, let's have a good hand, a strong hand for our panel here. <laughs>